Hello everyone, we're just kicking off our weekly welcome change session where we hear from social entrepreneurs around the world about timely topics and solutions. My name is Pip Wheaton and I'm the co-lead of Ashoka's Planet and Climate team. For the next 30 minutes, we'll be hearing from Ashoka fellow Mark Campanale about climate change in the finance industry. We're thrilled to have so many of you joining today, both from Ashoka's global community and from Mark's own community. So a big welcome to everybody. Before we get properly started, a few points of housekeeping. First of all, we would love to hear from you as we move along. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're going to get through as many of those as we can in the second half of the conversation. And secondly, for those of you who want to use captioning, you can select the three dots that say more at the bottom of the Zoom screen and then, show, then select show subtitles. Okay, so I would love to introduce today's guest. So I'm joined by Mark Campanale, who was elected last year as a senior Ashoka Fellow in the UK. Mark is the founder of two organizations working in the field of planet and climate, Carbon Tracker and more recently Planet Tracker. Their goal is to align capital markets with natural ecological limits to growth. Prior to this, prior to founding these organizations, Mark worked for 25 years in sustainable finance working for major institutional asset management companies. And he also co-founded some of the first responsible investment funds starting back in, in 1989. Uh, and, and excitingly, just yesterday, he was awarded the annual Joan Bavaria Award for Sustainable Finance at the Series Conference, which is an award for the industry, which is, is great that uh, his work is getting this recognition. Mark, you've been up close to some pretty incredible shifts in how investment is done worldwide, particularly as it relates to our understanding of how finance and the environment are linked. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today about what you've seen through your career and what shifts you mm. see on the horizon. So to kick us off, um, I wanted to start with talking a little bit about unburnable carbon. So your work has shifted the way that trillions of dollars has been invested and divested. And this, this concept of unburnable carbon has, has um, underpinned this incredible shift. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Hmm. Thanks, Bill. Well, uh, that's a very generous and warm welcome. And hello to fellow uh, uh, Shoka members, fellows and, and um, colleagues who've joined today's call. Um, well, it's a very simple concept, actually. In fact, so simple that um, when I was working on it through the late 90s and early noughties and, and I started work very closely with uh, my good friend Nick Robbins who had the other co-founder Carbon Tracker with me but he's, he's not working with us at now um, is we were thinking about climate change it's a, it's, it's a problem of the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we know where that comes from it comes from the burning of fossil fuels it comes from other things too like land use change and and so on but it's um, Primarily, the buildup is primarily from burning fossil fuels. Uh, and so we know, well, actually, who, who owns the fossil fuels? Well, governments do, we don't know that, like the Saudis and so on. And it's owned by corporations like Shell and Exxon. And they have these things called reserves, which they spend years accumulating and they invest billions a year finding more. What happens if Exxon and Shell and all the other companies were to burn all their reserves? How much would that increase atmospheric CO2? And if they did, uh, how much would the planet warm by? It doesn't sound that difficult a question. And so, I, I, honestly, honestly, we spent from about 1999 to about 2006 going around presenting this idea to lots of different environmental groups and meeting with academic bodies and saying, look, this is such an obvious question. Somebody must have done it. There's tens of thousands of scientists out there, all these academics. Um, we, want to, we, want, we want the numbers because we want to analyze the numbers and we want to to do something and we just couldn't find anybody who'd done that research uh, so um, I took the idea to a few foundations and they said well answering that question is really important um, but it's such an obvious thing um, somebody must have done it and if it's been done it could have amounted to much because if it amounted to something the world would have done something about it so we're not going to fund you can you believe that can you follow the logic um, really remarkable, actually. We have a few jokes about it now. But it's one particular funder, a guy called Jamie Arbid from Telus Marta Foundation. And uh, his family had a, f a fund management company. 
And he said, oh, no, this sounds really interesting. And after, th after two, three years of, of, of walking the streets to meet people, we've, we raised the 3,000 pounds that we needed to, um, uh, and I borrowed some money as well, a couple of thousand pounds, um, to, to pull, pull the analysis together that proved that we actually had something. And, and then that led to us going to Rockefeller Brothers Fund and they found us actually. Um, and allowed us to launch this report on burnable carbon. And so just to, to get to the conclusion, what did we find? We, find? we found that um, there's enough proven reserves already um, in the world today uh, to take us way past four degrees of warming. It's about seven times more proven reserves of coal, oil and gas to exceed a one and a half degrees warming outcome, which is the threshold the science tells us we shouldn't exceed. Uh, so you create all these what we call stranded assets. So that's that's what the um, unburnable carbon. And we 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 described it as a carbon bubble. We didn't say it was a financial bubble. We said it was a carbon bubble. There's too much carbon, but we then said it has financial consequences for financial regulators and for investors. And that's that's as simple as that. And and in some ways it's really obvious, which is what surprised uh, us that um, it had such a dramatic change in the way people thought about the issue and then led to the divestment movement and Bill McKibben's work and so on. So. And so just to, I mean, I love the fact that, you know, that that 3000 pounds that you were, um, you were given early on is probably some of the most influential philanthropic money that's ever been spent in, uh, in philanthropy, in climate change, uh, given that- It took that's us three years triggered. to find it. Three years <laughs> to find it. Um, but the the I think the thing that I find really interesting about this is, you know, you're you're basically using the same logic of the investment market to show that we shouldn't be investing in fossil fuels in the future. So you're using the the profit logic rather than trying to convince people that the environment is something worth sacrificing profit for. And I think that's a really that's a really powerful message. Yeah, Pepe, I think so. And and. Uh... Um, we're all social beings, and I've got to say, one of the things that triggered me, there were two things that triggered me. One, one was this guy who I know quite well, and I still see him occasionally, who was going around the city saying that climate change um, is not financially material for investors. Right. I, I, I used to say to him, um, that's not right. That's not right. And this is a guy with a PhD. And uh, he, 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 he gave that same speech about a dozen times, and each time it was it just totally wound me up. Still winds me up, actually. So I thought I've got it. We've got we've got to prove that to be wrong because we do think it has financial consequences. It, it is material, and it's proven the financial materiality that was the crucial bit, which was go, why we go back to baselines, the science of carbon budgets, the base that gives us the baseline that allows you to evaluate the fossil fuel companies. That was the first, and the second one um, was the IPO of two coal companies. One. One was called Asia Energy, it's called Asia Energy. And, and it's a, they're building a coal-fired power station in Bangladesh, which as people know, is the country that's most likely to be flooded uh, from extreme weather events and rising sea levels. First, one of the first countries, why would you build a coal-fired power station? And in the broker's note, promoting the share issue, they said, they said two things. One is that um, coal is an alternative energy source. I actually said that, because it's an alternative to wood, which of course is what they use in Bangladesh. Um, and the other thing they said is don't worry if Bangladesh floods because the coal-fired power station is such high ground, high up in the, the country, it will never be affected by the flooding. And, and the graphs and the table and the diagrams from that broker's report are used in the first kind of, you know, launch discussions because it was just illustrated the ignorance and the uh, cynicism by which investors look at these issues until you find something that really challenges their, their fundamental beliefs. And the other one was the listing of Extrata, which is now part of, of um, Glencore, which is one of the world's largest coal producing companies. And um, uh, I read the 300 page prospectus and in that there was only 20 lines relating to climate change. And all this company does is produce coal, of course, which, um, and I thought, well, look, regulators are not on top of their game. The investors aren't understanding the risks. And that was a, another kind of real trigger because I thought, well, let's let's change mindsets. Let's get regulators understanding the systemic risks of climate change and let's get the shareholders of these companies thinking about what well, they could be doing better. 
it's horrifying some of the, the what you referred to as cynicism I, I probably would have been a little bit uh, harsher with my language there but um, horrifying that that's sort of the logic that uh, that we've seen I think one of the um, one of the interesting things in this space though is just how things how quickly things are changing yeah. so you know we're seeing really encouraging signs that what's acceptable and what's not is finally shifting um, yeah. so, you know, one place we see this is with big companies, even oil and gas companies and coal companies, yeah. finally making public pledges about reaching net zero by 2050, which, you know, that's that's great. And I'm, I'm really excited to see that so many are recognising that they need to take action. Yeah. But are those commitments enough? Mm. Yeah. Um, in today's Guardian, um, there's an article about the RAN, the Rainforest Action Network report on banks and climate change and the financing of the fossil fuel industry. And in today's garden, that, that I, I'm quoted saying a few things about it. Um, and it, you can find the article. It, if, if those who follow me on Twitter, I'm at Campanali Mark, you can find me tweet the story out. What it finds is that since Paris, hundreds of billions of dollars have been lent to the coal and oil and gas industries since the Paris Agreement was signed. And the qual quantum of capital that's been lent by banks like JP Morgan Chase has gone up. It hasn't gone down. It hasn't gone down, it's gone up. Um, and Carbon Tracker, we're doing our own report shortly on looking at the, the fossil fuel IPOs. Um, fossil fuel companies have raised nearly 10 times more capital than renewable energy companies in, uh, in the last sort of decade or so. Uh, so we are we we know what the problems are we just it's very difficult to do something about it when your living is based on continuing to do what you've always done um i think investors shareholders understand this and whilst banks and the, the bond markets have not moved as fast as equity markets and in some ways you know the bond and, and uh, um bank lending is more important to companies than than the value of their shares uh, what the or what the shareholders are concerned about uh, basically, the investors are doing things, and and there we've seen really, really important change. And I, and I want to highlight well two things really. What well, the first is um, the social movement led by Bill McKibben and 350.org, the letter, the divestment of fossil fuels. And Bill, they took a, a headline from um, my report, the Unburnable Carbon Report, um, called "Do the Maths." Well, they, except in, in America, they call it do the math, which you know, it works for America. It doesn't work for the English, as you know, as you know, Pip. Um, and they launched this tour and that led to the divestment. And I went out to New York. I happened to be uh, due to go there to, to be at the launch. And and uh, the student movement has been colossal, affecting colleges all, all over the world. And now um, endowments and pension funds have reached 14 trillion dollars of divested fossil fuels since we launched the report in 2011. And the other thing was was um, being in, in New York, uh, maybe it would have been about four years ago now at the uh, French ambassador's residency with senior people from IIGCC, from Ceres, from PRI that led to the creation of Climate Action 100, which is institutional investors getting together. And that's, that coalition is, has reached 52 trillion, um, which is beginning to sound like real money, Pip. Um, and uh, the... Um, the institutions that are taking the world's largest polluters and saying, we need a transition plan. We need, we need uh, an analysis to show that you're moving towards well below two degrees. And um, yesterday, um, the benchmark was report, was published and has been extensively reported. It was yesterday or the day before. Um, and Carbon Tracker, we've provided our own research into this that shows most companies, particularly the fossil fuel companies, the oil and gas companies, are not Paris aligned. In fact, none of them are in their plans but the investors are on the case and i think investor activism is ramping up the work of groups like engine one tackling exxon's board we're moving from the please show us you have a plan we're now moving to a stage of if you haven't got a plan we're going to remove board directors until you get to the stage where you actually have a plan and then we want to see the plan implemented and that's the really the next wave of investor activism around climate is is getting very serious with boards removing people appointing different directors, refusing to appoint, reappoint auditors, um, change, asking for management to be planned, to be changed. And something I was working on um, with some colleagues last week is, is, is a whole new business plan for one of the fossil fuel majors um, to essentially say, if you can't implement a Paris-aligned plan, we've got a new plan. 
And that's probably going to need new management. And if the shareholders want that, and a growing number of investors want that, with this sort of say on climate campaign uh, being being led by different environmental groups and funded by by the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, I think things are moving up, and and it's getting a bit tougher for companies to 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 sort of say words and have no action. But I think is a really exciting place to be. It, I'm I'm interested though. You know, it was. You know, very recently that the news came out about Danone though, right? The shareholders there removing the oh. CEO because his social and environmental agenda was too strong, uh, you know, and it was felt that it was coming at the risk of profit. So it's sort of, we've got these two things happening in parallel. What what do you think is going to get it to tip over into the, the version where directors are being removed for, for being not environmental enough? Yeah, I mean, that was a body blow felt by many actually what happened at Danone. Um, and uh, I, like, I, I might have to get a little bit philosophical here. Um, I think this essentially is the innate problem at the heart of, of, um, of markets, of capitalism, as we know it, this tension, this drive to constant um, growth in, in profits in, in a world which is constrained by physical limits, practical limits. And, and, and as a consequence, it, there is a, there's a tension here. And that tension is not readily resolved. And it's not just a tension between the environment and, uh, and people who own capital or represent capital. It's a tension with, with, um, with people as well. You know, we've got, um, you know, we've just seen in the press just this weekend um, how Goldman's is being challenged by his, his young staff for, for working what's insane. What is it, 70 hour weeks? Insane. 95 um, hour weeks I think was, was hey, one of them yeah you're right it, it was like let's please limit it to 80 which just yeah is I mean it's yeah. this tension and and so people say well you need a different model a different model of stakeholder capitalism you probably do I would say that the, the heart of this and I saw this from working in the city um I'll tell you there was a there was a privatization of water companies that happened in the United Kingdom about 30 years ago because the state used to own the water industry and they were split into a dozen water companies. And um, I attended a meeting with some of the water companies and one of the fund managers that was there looked after the um, pension scheme for the water workers. And the pension, and the, the pension fund manager uh, in meeting the water company said, how, how, what efficiencies can you introduce? What job cuts can you make? Because we need to maximize the returns to produce the benefits for our pension fund members. I said to the guy, I said, but you're asking to, to destroy the jobs of the, pe of the people whose, whose pension schemes you're managing. Don't you see the contradiction? And he said, no, I have a duty to make sure that we maximize returns, that companies are efficient. And if that, if that means losing workers, uh, then tough, tough, that's the world that we're in. And that kind of, can you, that's a real story because I, I saw it and, and lived through it. And, um, and that just shows the insane kind of contradiction that you have or this tension. So I, I think the answer to this is you have to remove the, 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 um, the professional fund managers in the middle think that they're the only ones that have a voice in the game. And actually the people who have a voice in the game are the beneficiaries or society as a whole. And we've got to find a way that the views of society is expressed in the ways that fund managers speak with the management um, of companies in which they're a shareholder. And so one of the most important developments for me that's happened in the last 18 months is, and it's not just legal in general, but legal in general is working with um, a IT company that can allow individual members of an insured pension scheme. So, you know, in a large insured pension scheme, there's hundreds of thousands of people that co-invest together. That's worked out a way that individual members can express a voice on how they want their shares to be voted on different shareholder resolutions. So it's now technologically possible to go beyond the fund manager down to the level of the individual beneficiaries and say, what's your view on executive pay? What's your view on diversity on the board? Give us your view on climate. And it, we're moving to a stage where individuals can say, I think we should appoint more um, minority community representatives and women on the board. I want more climate resolutions to be supported. And individuals can express that. And it will be the ultimate democratization that will hopefully begin to balance out some of these tensions and contradictions that we saw happen at Danone. And, and I, I think what's happened at Danone will, will be a stain 
it's not the first time and it won't be the last time, but it's a stain on, on the whole notion of, of stakeholder capitalism, to be, to be frank. Um, just a, a reminder to those of you who are listening in, if you've got any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, because I would, I would love to hear from you. Um, uh, before I sort of switch into getting questions from, from everybody else uh, mode, I wanted to change tack just a little bit. Last time when we caught up, you mentioned something new that you've been working on, uh, oh, yeah. the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty which sounds yes. fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and why you think it's needed? Um, yeah, th th thanks Pitt for asking me that. So um, whenever you're sitting down and talking with um, representatives of the coal and gas industry, and I will be tomorrow, I'm, ch I'm chairing a, um, a discussion with the CEOs of Total and um, Occidental, it's an open event and Petronas and a few others. Um, is they say they have to produce the fossil fuels that the world demands, even though this will break climate limits. They have to do this. Um, and, and if we didn't, um, somebody else would step in and produce the fossil fuels that we have decided not to produce. Now, that is really a problem of kind of begging your neighbor kind of politics. If I don't do something, my neighbor will do it and, and so on, and it's competition. So, so nobody really wants to cut the production of fossil fuels and, or be the first to, um, but I must call out BP for actually taking a stand and announcing a cut in production of fossil fuels. Uh, they're saying, well, look, our competitors will, will step in. So, so what we really need is a global collective agreement, a non-proliferation that says countries will hand back oil and gas licenses, cancel coal permits, and that we should be canceling those um, permits until we get to, en to cancel enough that gets the reserves down to well below two degrees and that we then have a rethink. Because what we've done in 50 years, is we've burned this extraordinary precious resource, particularly oil and gas, um, to power things and, and when we don't need to any longer because of electrification. Um, and yet these same uh, hydrocarbons could be used for complex pharmaceuticals, for innovative plastics for all kinds of different materials. And instead what we seem to be determined to do is to burn uh, hundreds of thousands of years worth in literally 50, you know, 60 years. Um, when we could, we could be saving this up for, for hundreds of years into the future to be used for, for far more useful things, but just do, do anything with it except a single use plastics or combustion is my view. Um, if you want to use it for syringes to inoculate people, please do. If you want to use it for cannulas for people for, you know, in hospitals, please do. But uh, just don't, don't use it to, to burn, to, to move from A to B when we don't need to do that anymore. So the whole idea of the treaty is to bring governments and corporations together to have that, have that open discussion, fossilfueltreaty.org. And we've been having some wonderful discussions with delegations from Denmark and Germany and the Netherlands and Ireland. And, and it's been positive positive reception. Um, I've even talked to you know, the OECD and the IA and with colleagues and um, they've been intrigued and interested. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful. Great, well, I look forward to seeing uh, how it progresses. Um, so I've got a, a question come in from those listening uh, to the conversation. So the question is, what do you attribute your success to? A lot of people put research out into the world, but they don't change mindsets across industries. And what's different here? Um, that's really, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I think it's, um, well, you have to have some gutsy determination. And if, even if people are saying, there's nothing new here, you're wrong, it's not interesting, who cares? If your instinct, stick with your instinct. The other, I have to say this is, to a degree, good old fashioned luck. If, if Naomi Klein hadn't given a copy of, we only printed a hundred copies of our first report, okay? If she hadn't given a copy to Bill McKibben and if Bill hadn't read Global Warming's Terrifying New Math that had hundreds of thousands of downloads and if the students hadn't created pandemonium in some instances, it wasn't welcomed at places like Harvard and, and beyond, that they in turn had to write to UBS and Goldman Sachs and so on. And um, I don't know if you saw this, this week, 
it was released BlackRock's recommendations to the City of New York Pension Fund to divest from fossil fuels. Did has, has anyone seen this? It came out, I think, it came out yesterday through IEFA. Um, so the world's really changed, and and it needs a bit of coincidence. And it was the it was the social movement really that drove it because it forced investors and pension funds to look at something they didn't want to look at in detail, and also regulators. The other thing that changed it was being asked by Mark Carney to present to the Financial Stability Board um, of the G20 in, it would have been about five or six years ago now. And then Mark Carney, a few weeks later, gave his own speech at Lloyd's of London, where he took the words from our first report um, on stranded assets. And he gave his own stranded assets speech that led to the launch of the TCFD. Um, and I was invited to present to the first meetings of the TCFD, the Task Force and Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And that was very fortunate because what that did is mainstream in the regulatory community, a lot of what we've been saying, we've been going in to see the Bank of England. We bet literally everything on, on just seeing one bank, which was the Bank of England, and, and we had access and, and they took it very seriously, hence you know, being asked to present it. Um, and that was very fortunate. If that hadn't happened, um, some of the unburnable car, I don't think the unburnable carbon would have got as fast as, it would have been picked up, but uh, it would have gone slower. So, so to a degree, um, being fortuitous and and uh, yeah, may, and maybe lighting a few prayer candles possibly along the way. And getting other people to, to light prayer candles for you, uh, yeah. as the case may be. Um, okay, I've got, I've got another question. Um, it's just come through. So will voluntary divestment, i.e. motivated at least in part by self-interest, for example, the BlackRock example that you just gave, um, will voluntary divestment be enough versus mandated divestment via policies, regulation or citizen-led action. Is there mm. danger in celebrating private sector commitments to become carbon neutral in the future as it might lead to a false sense that we are on the right track versus way, way behind? Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with the sentiment of this question. We, we, need, we need government action. And the problem with the Paris Climate Agreement, for all of its strengths, it's an emissions reduction treaty. It's not a fossil fuel supply constraint agreement. Fossil fuels are not mentioned anywhere in the Paris Climate Agreement, as, as I'm sure most, if not all list, listeners know. And that's why we need a new global agreement to, to refrain from the production of fossil fuels, which is what, what we're calling the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, the way the emperor of, of um, China dealt with the opium addiction was to declare war on the opium industry, which is, and hence the opium wars, which the Americans and the French and the British went to war and defeated the, the, the emperor of China first opium war and in response it led to the second one because he didn't give up and the second opium war until ultimately opium was was essentially abolished or banned because workers couldn't work and we've got a similar situation where the planet can't breathe because we're imposing this burning of fossil fuels on it on, on mankind and the planet and and ultimately we're going to have to ban the combustion of fossil fuels and and that isn't going to come through voluntary action I do think that actually the divestment movement is, is led by a technological revolution. The fact that electric vehicles will be cheaper, the internal combustion engine, that 60% um, of the world's coal fleet is not making money, it's cash flow negative. Uh, it's cheaper to build renewables now in most parts of the world than it is to build gas or coal. Um, and, and this is remarkable. So it's going to be driven by technology, but technology won't save us. We have to move faster than the technology can move. So we're very almost at time. I probably should call it here, but we've had one question that really is yeah. just perfect. Um, uh, so what are your thoughts on the theory of degrowth? And for anybody who's not uh, familiar with the, the theory of degrowth, it's, it's basically looking at uh, the current economic system and saying we're, we're focused on, on growth and, and profit as the ultimate objective. We can't do that on a planet with, with finite limits. And so what's needed is a managed, uh, globally just uh, program of, of slowing down and then, and then reducing growth over time. Um, Mark, what's, what's your take on that? Yes. Um, and we should also add to that um, a proper balance sheet of the planet. So when we eat into natural capital, we should be taking that off the, 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 the credit side of the balance sheet because we're actually destroying something. We're not creating something. And what we, you know, if you chop down a, 
um, a, 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 a tree from a rainforest that could be worth ten thousand dollars, but you're selling it for a hundred because that's what the market value is. For example, you're you're actually losing value. You're not creating value. And yet, of course, the system we have now only the only says the only value is the hundred dollars you've collected, not the ten thousand it's worth. And we treat entire nature like that. Um, and we we treat people like that too. And 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 I and I think that uh, we need a. I mean, the other big things I care about most is is um, you know the, the key responsibilities of corporations is is not just paying sort of um, a fair wage and a living wage, but uh, a truly uh, a wage that represents the value created by 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 workers. And we've seen all kinds of um, issues in, inside stakeholder capitalism where where the workforce are not being properly getting a voice. And I think the most responsible thing um, that corporations can do actually is is pay their taxes where they make their profits. And we've seen. Uh, problems that corporations minimize what they should be paying as are high net worths offshoring their tax. And as a consequence, these tax burdens are being borne by the many to save the interests of the few. And, and these are the big issues facing us in, in, in corporate um, responsibility in ESG. They're the key ones in, in my mind, along with climate. What a great note to end on. That's Thanks, unfortunately... Thanks, everybody. Yeah, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. But Mark, thank you for such a fascinating conversation. And thank you to everybody for joining us and, and sticking around for the, the extra minute for those of you who did. Um, look out for a follow up email with a link to today's recording and highlights that you can browse and share. And we hope that we'll join you next time. I see that we've got in the chat uh, a bit about what the, the upcoming uh, next week's session is going to be. But we've also got conversations coming up about Indigenous food systems and the future of food. Uh, mental health and teens, deaf, deaf culture and early language access, and so much more. Uh, and you can sign up at the link in the chat. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.